Hello and welcome to a fascinating Nautical Institute webinar. Uh, uh, we are going to be talking about GMDSS today. And I'm joined here by Kyle Hurst. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. And I will introduce Kyle a, a little bit more in a moment. Um, I'm sure that you're all very uh, aware of the Nautical Institute and what we do, but just in a recap, we are an international professional body. Uh, we help our members. We're a membership organization, by the way, and you're absolutely welcome to join as a member. Uh, in fact, I encourage it. Um, more of that to come. Um, but we help our members with professional development. Uh, we also represent our members at organizations like the IMO, IALA, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason we do this, we are a collective of professionals. And, we really believe that by talking to each other, by sharing ideas, we can help better understanding and that better understanding will lead to better decisions. And that's what it's all about. We really want to help people make better decisions. And that's not just about safety. Of course, safety is very important, but commercial and even private decisions, really important stuff. And this is one of the reasons why we're so interested in GMDSS. Uh, GMDSS, as all mariners will know, um, it is absolutely cru crucial, it's critical to what we do at sea. It not only uh, has the potential of saving our lives, but the lives of other seafarers are, as well. So understanding it, making good decisions on how to use it, making the right decisions on how to equip your vessel with it, how to test it to make sure it's working, is all absolutely critical information. So we're really pleased to have Kyle here today. It is my great pleasure to invite back um, Kyle Hurst, who I have known and worked with for many, many years, and it's just a privilege to have him on this channel. He is the Director of Maritime Safety and Security Service for Iridium Communications, Inc. Um, most of you will uh, be familiar with Iridium. He, uh, he brings to Iridium 20 years experience in the maritime satellite communications business. He um, he represents the services for seafarers. He's the guy that tries to look after uh, everything so that when you press the button, you get help. And that's really important for us. He represents Iridium at the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. He used to be a, um, a, a, a VMS manager, so he was the shore side as well. So, and an ex seafarer, so he understands things from both sides. And he's now helps create designs that make seafarers' lives easier and to make sure that the equipment is fit for purpose, which is really great. Like I said, I've known Kyle for many years and he does a great job. And Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. Um, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Fantastic introduction. I'm wondering who you're talking about half the time. <laughs> is that me? Um, but thank you very, very much. As David said, my name is Kyle Hurst. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Iridium GMDSS today. And uh, it's a bit of an update from last year because we did a, uh, a webinar with the Nautical Institute. It's a fantastic event. Um, so we decided to do it again, but also we're going to be updating um, uh, or refreshing information about the system and also updating on new information. So here we go. Okay. So first slide, David, if you could uh, move that ahead. So just a refresher um, on something I called the three C's, why Iridium GMDSS is important, why it's a, a key service. Um, the three C's are basically cost, coverage, and capability. Um, if you know much about the Iridium system, coverage is absolute. Um, in our view, the cost, and very, you know, many others view, cost is lower, and capability is improved. Here, just specifically on this slide, um, we're talking about the voice capability. For the last uh, 20 or so years in the existing system, you haven't had um, a, you know, easy access to distress voice. The, the, the main equipment that's used um, in GMDSS for the past 20 years doesn't have voice, um, but with the Iridium system, it's all in one terminal. And I, from my point of view, it, it is a crucial link. You know, when I was at sea, we had uh, the older system, which meant you held down the button and, it, you know, it sent that um, very basic information uh, just in a distress alert. So who you are, where you are, and that you're in distress, which is great. But just talking um, to 
people today that work in rescue coordination centers and my own experience either being on one, in one case on, on a vessel and we had some trouble and you know that that experience of when you get into danger and my experience of trying to help people from shoreside that link to talk to someone is key and if you've ever been in a situation where things have gotten dangerous or scary and you've had to try and call for emergency services talking to someone on the phone and relaying your situation is good for you you uh, you know you can it's comforting to, to talk to someone in, in those particular strange circumstances and I will say it is very good for the people on the other end the rescue coordination center in this case so sure with the distress alert you get the simple information who you are where you are that you're in distress that's fine but then with the voice capability of the iridium system they can then talk to you they can find out you know how many people on board what's the nature of the distress is it flooding fire and um, what are you doing about it um you know what are the what measures are you able to take to help yourself uh, are you abandoning ship or not and from that they can design a very specific um response um, to your particular situation, which can make all the difference. I mean, there is a massive, massive difference between, say, a, a fishing vessel just off the coast with three people on board and, uh, you know, maybe a large cruise ship with almost 3,000 people on board. Um, so, yeah, they, they need that information to make sure they uh, design an appropriate response uh, um, and, and send out the correct assets. So the status of Iridium GMDSS, um, we're recognized uh, over four years ago now. Um, it was, uh, I think, May in 2018, so quite a while ago. Um, we are fully operational for Iridium GMDSS, and we uh, have been since the launch in December 2020. So we're just coming up to our second year of operation, coming to our third year, I should say, completed our second year, our third year. <clears throat> um, I believe, and many other people agree with me that this is an improved capability in general, but also when it's dealing with SAR operations, and again, going back to that example of voice, um, but there are other systems in the uh, Iridium GMDSS that improve the communication from ship to shore and shore to ship. The whole point of these improved systems is to speed up communication to make sure the people who need the information get it as quickly as possible, and then they can react as quickly as possible. The quicker those assets, you know, the, the appropriate response gets to the people in distress, the more lives can be potentially saved. So, you know, it, it's an ongoing uh, drive for not only us, but everyone in the safety community to always try and make things better. Um, the broadcast system in the Iridium GMDSS, the Iridium Safety Cast, um, it also provides an improved capability in relation 20 years um, in particular um, now the people on shore can actually see um, that the, uh, the the system is working so they can confirm <clears throat> through looking at their iridium interface that their system is working um, and also there's been numerous improvements to um, SAR through what we've done but also we're uh, able to improve SAR operations um, with the current 12 rescue coordination centers that we have integrated, and there's more on the way, um, quite a few more, um, and they are connected to the Iridium GMDSS. So looking at the, the, the equipment that goes on board the vessel, this is the LT3100S. Um, it is, uh, well, as the picture says there, it's basically a, a Swiss Army knife of maritime communications. In other words, you've got all sorts of different features that you can fold out and use. <clears throat> On the uh, left-hand side there, you've got all the GMDSS capabilities, including distress alert, distress calling, but you also have other priority calling. So you can basically make just a uh, what we call a safety call to an RCC. If you see maybe a red flare on the horizon, you think, oh, that's strange. I wonder if that's real. You can call up the RCC, not an emergency, a safety call. So it's what we call a priority three call, distress being priority one. And you can call up the RCC and say, look, I think I just saw a flare on the horizon. Not really sure. It's about, you know, north of where I am. And then the RCC could potentially use that in uh, conjunction with other information they have. So you could actually be helping them to solve a bit of a mystery and, again, get appropriate resources to a potential situation. Um, we have MSI, um, the Maritime Safety Information, which is the broadcast um, information that I talked about before. 
Um, things like priority messaging, bridge alert management systems, so the ability to feed like um, emergency information from the terminal into the other systems on the bridge, navigational interface, again, feeding into the navigational systems, um, all sorts of other things, printers, you name it. So they're all the GMDSS functions. And on the non-GMDSS side, we have the ability to do just general communications, general voice, you can ring up, call your mum, you never call her enough. Um, SMS, you can send SMSs and receive SMSs through this uh, terminal. Um, you can do emails, small emails, you can do tracking. Um, it can also output um, GPS or GNSS information. Um, you can plug in other phone systems or other phone handsets to it, so you can use external handsets. Um, you can also do the security systems um, through this terminal. So SSAS, which is like the, the panic button for um, ships, big ships, if they you know they have an incident on board and they need to report it, they can press one of the um, covert um, uh, SSAS buttons. And LRIT, the security system um, brought in almost 20 years ago now, over 20 years ago now, uh, for tracking ships all over the world. So all of that in one simple terminal. Just a quick look at SSAS, this is how it sets up. So basically you've got your buttons there. As I said, they're normally covertly placed in the ship. Um, you've got an interface box that then feeds into the existing MDSS terminal. Um, and then obviously the uh, out through the antenna to connect to the Iridium network. Um, but normally you just have the control unit and the antenna. But if you want to add uh, SSAS, you just need to add the interface unit and the SSAS buttons. You're up and running with SSAS, and that means you've got security, safety, normal comms, all in one terminal. Next is LRIT. Um, this is just a description of how the information flows, but again, it comes from the LT3100S terminal, goes through Iridium, being the communication service provider, and then goes into what we call an application service provider, and then they basically send the information into the, the large network, the international network, um, for passing that information around. Uh, as per the LRIT requirements. So again, another capability packed into that little box. Just looking at cost, um, you know, the traditional system has been around for quite a long time, um, but it is, it's quite expensive. Um, and so one of the key things that, you know, I believe in is if we can make our solution, number one, better, because we should always be trying to make things better in the field of safety, um, but also lower cost because, uh, in, in my view, um, well, it's if it's basically outside of everyone's reach, uh, you know, maybe the greatest safety in the sy safety system in the world, but it's if it's outside financially everyone's reach, then it's going to have a limited effect. And the other key component is, in my view, often it's smaller vessels that need the most help. They, you know, they they can be affected by large weather a lot more easily. Like a two meter wave is not really a big problem for a big ship. Um, but the small vessel, uh, that's that can be a big deal. Um, so they have potentially, uh, you know, they're more uh, they're more problematic with um, weather conditions and things like that. And also smaller vessels, specifically leisure vessels, they're less professional mariners. You know, they might be, um, you know, what I grew up with, uh, trailer sailors um, and things like that. So, uh, you know, they don't have that depth of knowledge. They're not at sea all the time. And so they can potentially make mistakes. Um, uh, but, you know, making a mistake is not necessarily a, a crime, but you definitely don't want to pay for it with your life. So having a good safety system there, that just in case you get into trouble, you can always get help from shore, I think is a crucial thing, and making it available to more and more people, uh, and making sure it's low cost as, or as low cost as possible um, is key as well. We have had quite a, a number, or we always have lots of installations, but some big installations. And when I say big, I mean physically big. Um, this vessel, you may recognize it, the uh, Mumbai Maersk, it's, um, I think it's one of the sixth, because there's a number of them. So it's a triple E class, second generation. And I think the fifth or the sixth largest vessels in the world. And so in excess, I believe, of 20,000 containers or TEUs. Um, it, magnificent vessel. Um, really good. I was lucky enough to go on board. I took these photos. Um, so another talent. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was a very, very large and impressive vessel. And it was great to talk to the crew and their experiences, not only just in general, but also just talking them through the system and how the system works and just getting the feedback from them 
um, that you know the, the improvements potentially that our, our system can make. So, you know, great great experience um, for me personally to go out and see a big ship like this, but also for me professionally to see the the value of our technology. We also have a number of companies that are basically putting in place a policy that they're going to actively um, replace older GMDSS technology um, with our technology because it's newer, more capable uh, and low cost and also um, greater coverage. Um, and this is one of the um, uh, companies, uh, Yondanul, has basically spoken publicly about the fact that they are going to um, uh, you know, definitely move towards Iridium GMDSS as they want it on board all of their vessels. Um, so it's a, another endorsement from the industry that we've done a good job, which is which is fantastic. Um, many different flags have approved the Iridium GM DSS. The equipment itself has to be type approved for the um, flag of, um, the, uh, of the vessel. So we have had a lot of success with um, flag nations, including um, some flags that have made specific conditions um, in relation to Iridium GM DSS. In other words, that you don't have to have other equipment because you have Iridium GM DSS and because it can do uh, things that other systems can't, in particular the area um, A4. So another endorsement of uh, you know the, the work that we've done and, and the value of our technology, which is fantastic. Okay, so uh, rescue coordination centers. So um, next year we're looking at adding um, all of the US Coast Guard RCCs. We're gonna try and do that in Q1 of next year. It's a lot of work to do. Um, we do have some new RCCs that we've added recently as well. So um, Larnaca, JRC, JRCC Larnaca in Cyprus and MRCC Riga in Latvia. So basically JRCC means it's a joint RCC, which means it does um, air, land, sea, um, whereas an MRCC generally deals with maritime, just to make sure you knew that. Um, but we also have numerous other RCCs waiting to move forward, but unfortunately, resources are limited. A lot of it, the training comes down to me. Um, so yes, we are, um, we are moving forward. We are adding lots of new RCCs to the system, which is fantastic. We actually only need one under the rules, um, but yeah, I envisage that by the end of next year, we'll have in excess of uh, 20 or more, depending on how quickly I can bring them on board, basically. Um, we do have potential improvements to SAR operations based on what the Iridium system can do, which is great. And that's another part of not only just bringing in new um, rescue coordination centres, but trying to work with the existing rescue coordination centres and potentially updating their procedures to try and slick up their operations because they are able to communicate better with a vessel equipped with Iridium. Um, so, you know, taking advantage of, of that in their procedures. In other words, instead of doing A, B and C, do A, B and something else and then C because they can get more information. Um, we do have some suggestions, uh, improved guidance for SAR ops to be discussed and we work through the IMO bodies and also directly with the RCCs. But yeah, there's a lot of areas where we can improve stuff such as use of the um, distress, alert caping, uh, distress alert relay capability um, also, how we do the two-stage calling, which is the system that allows RCCs to make distress calls to a terminal. And all of it is about a faster, a more appropriate response, getting um, the right assets to the right place um, as quickly as possible to, to ensure we save as many lives as possible. Um, maritime safety information, there's been questions about this. We continue to work forward with this. Um, now, the good thing about Iridium GMDSS is for the first time in the history of GMDSS, we now have um, satellite-based maritime safety information available in polar zones. It's absolute. No matter where you are on the pole, you can get MSI. <clears throat> Previously, that was limited in the polar areas or non-existent in some cases. Um, so we have absolute um, global coverage, and uh, this is an automatic feature, uh, or there is an automatic feature in the Iridium system. So again, another improvement that basically persistently ensures vessels are up to date with the latest MSI. So there are situations where maybe um, a signal might get blocked. The Iridium system is persistent in the way it works. So it, you know, if there was a, a vessel underneath, a, say, an oil rig or something like that, probably shouldn't be there, but there was some way that that signal got blocked because um, there was you know, something wrong with the antenna or somehow it got blocked. The Iridium system is always working to try and make sure that that crucial information is pushed down to the terminal, um, and which is not um, available in the previous system historically. 
Um, so again, a step forward. Um, we have had a lot of meetings recently uh, under the banner of IMO. So the IMO EGC panel, the, the other two, which is basically in the is in the MET areas. There's been lots of discussion around uh, Iridium safety cast, our broadcast capability. And, you know, we are looking at ways to more effectively use EGC, which is the international banner of the broadcast system under GMDSS. So safety cast is the Iridium flavor of EGC, which is the global broadcast system of GMDSS. Um, a key thing about this, though, is we do have improved monitoring for the Iridium uh, safety cast system. And that it actually shows the providers that send out the information that the system is working globally. Um, traditionally, they use what we call a monitoring terminal. So people would send out a broadcast to a, a large area of the ocean telling people maybe there's a big uh, typhoon coming and they would have a terminal on their office and they could monitor a signal that came to that terminal. So they would know that because that it came to that terminal on their office, then it must have gone to those vessels way out there on the ocean, which is a, a level of uh, assurance. Um, however, the Iridium system actually is able to receive back confirmation from all the vessels. So, it, you know, that it broadcasts out to. So the, the operators who send out the broadcast can actually see, yes, that vessel actually did get that broadcast. I'm not assuming because of this terminal that I've got, I know that vessel way out there in the mid middle of the Atlantic actually got the um, broadcast. So another improvement. Um, new requirements for GMDSS, because we have the global capability, um, we are able to cover areas such as the poles that weren't able to be covered before. Um, and so you'll see there the Iridium 100% global second from the bottom, the areas A1 to A3. Um, that's now going to be the new standard um, because with the Iridium system, there is no A4 because A4, if you know about C areas, a4 was defined as the area outside of satellite coverage. For Iridium, that doesn't really exist unless you're on Mars or the Moon, um, which means you're very lost. Um, but anywhere on Earth, you have coverage for Iridium. And so the Solus, actually, the updates are already um, in Solus, but they don't take effect to the 1st of January 2024. There are some flags that have basically set up the rules already that you can use Iridium for compliance in, in the poles right now, but as of the 1st of January 2024, A3 for Iridium will be global and there will be no A4. So um, yeah, once that uh, change comes into effect, 1st of January 2024, it's bye-bye to A4 regions if, you're, uh, if you have Iridium GMDSS installed and also the requirements for HF um, uh, bye bye as well because you you have global satellite um, capability so you don't you're not required to carry um, the HF capability and just another demonstration of that so the, your old coverage um, uh, of the previous system um, you know you you had that limitation where it couldn't um, cover the poles and so you had these areas known as A4. So they are basically outside of the view of the, the older satellite system. Um, and so with those areas, you had to have um, other MF and even HF capabilities to be able to communicate in those areas because you didn't have satellite coverage. Um, however, on the next slide, you'll see that with uh, Iridium, the uh, area disappears. So here we see the Iridium. A3, global A3, there are no A4 areas. Um, and so vessels are equipped with Iridium can go anywhere. Um, if they're A3 class, they can go to the poles. It doesn't matter, there is no A4. And um, yeah, it's a, a good step forward in my mind. Okay, some other information. Um, that's happening, some new updates. Uh, last year we did a, a series of videos to try and uh, train people on the specific aspects of Iridium GMDSS. Um, you know, things that they could do with Iridium GMDSS that they couldn't do before, um, different ways of testing the system and all that. So we did a series, I think it was about eight videos um, this year, because um, they were so popular maybe, um, we did more, but we did actually get requests to do other videos. And so um, in the summer, we filmed another set of videos and they cover the unboxing of the equipment, just going through um, uh, 
you know, what the LT3100S is, what you get in the box. So anyone who's seen or looks at YouTube quite a lot and product reviews, you'll see the unboxing scenario is quite good. So I've done my version, so hopefully it comes across well. And we also do an in, uh, installation video demonstrating the, the major steps of how an Iridium GMDSS terminal is installed. It's not meant to replace a approved installer. It's basically there to give an overview of how it should occur um, you do need uh, an approved installer to, improve, uh, to install this equipment because it's life-saving equipment. You want a professional to install it to make sure it absolutely positively works first time every time. So uh, absolutely, definitely use a, um, uh, an installer. And then we have the commissioning. So the installation video covers the physical installation. The commissioning is basically the setup of the actual terminal itself. So going to the terminal and just confirming all the values and the terminal actually says, this is the vessel I think I'm on. These are the details of the vessel. Just confirming all of that, making sure that it's set up correctly, um, and then uh, and then it basically goes into operational service after that commissioning is run through. And the final video is a, an interview with the um, captain of the vessel that we did the installation and the commissioning on. Um, interesting fellow. Uh, he's got a I think it's a 45 foot um, sailing vessel. Oh, he'll kill me for getting that wrong if I've gotten it wrong. Um, lovely vessel, um, a, a really nice guy looking at doing around the world travels and his view on why Iridium GMDSS for him is not required under law, but for him is required in his own mind and his basically self-preservation. Um, so yeah, interesting from my perspective again to get the, the, the feelings and the perspective of an end user. And we are looking at bringing out more training material in the future and we also have various case studies coming up. Please. If you haven't seen them, check out the videos. I could do with the, the, the likes and subscribes, so don't forget to like and subscribe. That is pretty much it for me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, Excellent. Uh, Carl, that, that was, that was a, a great tour de force. Uh, so um, uh, thanks so much for, for going through all that. Lots of information. And, you know, obviously you, you represent Iridium, which is great. Um, but a lot of the material that you have, and I, I know a lot of the questions that are now coming in are for GMDSS in general. And I'm, I, I'm sure you'll be able to answer those all. Um, we have, um, for your delightment, audience, uh, you know, lots of polls and videos and things that will entertain you for the next half hour or so, um, and lots of Q&A questions coming in. But before we start on all that, I just would like to start with a real fundamental question, and this uh, comes in from Rees, and he says, are there any charges, uh, either for Iridium or for uh, Inmarsat or anybody else, for distress calls? Uh, short answer is no. <clears throat> Actually, the long answer is no as well. Um, under the requirements for GMDSS, um, so Resolution 1001.25 um, and A707, if you if you know the, the documents I'm talking about, you are not allowed. We're not allowed to charge for um, the, those specific um, GMDSS services. So if you press the red button, you do not get a bill. Um, number one, because it's not really fair. Um, but number two, because we are not allowed under the um, uh, IMO requirements to charge for those distress services. So, no. Okay. Th thanks, Carl. That, that was such a fundamental question. And it is so important uh, for everything that GMDS stands for. Uh, Absolutely. But, uh, I, I know that when you know Iridium were applying for to be recognized as a GMDSS provider, that was absolutely fundamental in the, the, the structure of GMDSS, that uh, emergency calls are free of charge. And, and by the way, one of the things about that is, <clears throat> of course, it's not fair, right, in my mind, to charge someone when they're in distress to yell for help. But I think the other aspect of that is no one wanted, you know, the mariner, the person out there at sea to have their service, their distress service cut off because maybe someone sure didn't pay the bill. So the idea of having it for free is not necessarily because, you know, uh, or not all about, you know, you know, it's a bit unfair to charge for distress. It's also very much about, well, if it's free, then it can't be cut off for non-bill payments. So, yeah, I, I think it's a very, very good principle of the GMDSS. 
Okay, uh, Kyle, that, that's a great point. Thank you very much for making that. Um, before we start uh, going into some of the Q&As, which are coming in thick and fast, uh, I would like just to do a few engagement polls. So if you could stand by your buzzers. Um, uh, I will launch this first uh, question, which is before this webinar, did you know that Iridium GMDSS is currently the only satellite able to uh, offer distress voice? Carl, can you just give a little bit of background on this one? Yeah, we we asked this question um, last year, so I'm, I'm you know I was generally before genuinely interested last year, and I'm also genuinely interested this year, but also to see if there's any delta there because, you know, I do think we've done a good, uh, a fantastic job, and talking to the people in, in the actual rescue side of the industry, they think this is very important, but uh, you know we want to make sure that people understand that th this is a pivotal um, feature of the Iridium system, um, and it can make all the difference. Um, because as I hopefully have conveyed to people, it's about getting the right information to the right people as quickly as possible. Um, and you know, as I said before, the difference between a fishing vessel with three people and a cruise ship with 3,000, pretty logistically huge difference. Um, so yeah, that <clears throat> that is crucial. And uh, you know, I really want to make sure people know it. Okay, okay. Uh, let me just close this out and share the results with you. Uh, Carl, can you see those results? Yeah, I can see them. So pretty it's, yeah, pretty pretty fifty fifty. So obviously we've still got some marketing work to do to make sure that um, uh, people do know this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's good to see that the figures come up. Um, uh, sorry, the, the the figure is you know at fifty percent. But obviously we just still do have some marketing and and some you know some information to push out there to make sure people realise. Okay, great. Um, looking at some of the questions that have come in, uh, this question comes from Hans, and it says, what is the status regarding safety cast and implementation in the GMDSS SOLUS approval process? Yep, so it's completely approved and has been since, um, uh, well, we've approved and operational, and we've been operational, absolutely operational since December 2020. Um, the only thing that, uh, you know, we're still waiting on is some of the coastal states to ensure they're broadcasting all their information to us. So um, we do have regular meetings um, about that. In fact, just yesterday, I think it was, no, the day before yesterday, we had one of the um, IMO meetings, the IMO EGC panel, where um, this was a hot item. And I do think that we are gonna see uh, a lot of um, progress in these particular areas about improving things um, in relation to uh, uh, the information uh, between now and the end of the year, definitely, but also in the first half of next year, uh, we're going to see definitive improvements in maritime safety information. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's an ongoing process, but there is a real drive and determination around it presently. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl, um, you, you, you mentioned in your presentation that Iridium is now um, uh, one of two uh, approved GMDSS providers. Uh, obviously, that's uh, in Marsat and now Iridium. Uh, there is talk that there may be some others. Uh, can you com uh, comment on what the future might hold uh, for possible other uh, GMDSS providers? Yeah, I think there was some movement recently. Um, Baidu, uh, I believe, was recognized recently. Um, when I say recognized, if you're not familiar with the process, it's kind of like the first step. There is a lot that needs to be done after recognition. And you'll recognize that from our side where we, you know, we were recognized in 2018, but we didn't start operational service till 2020. Um, so uh, they've been recognized. They've got a, a number of things they have to do. Um, their coverage presently is uh, just basically based around China. Um, but, you know, in my view as a, you know, as an ex-mariner and as a, a technologist, I think that's a word, um, you know, I have no problem with more um, providers coming into the industry. It, you know, it drives us um, to sort of, you know, keep on improving things. Um, and, you know, we do, I think as a, oh, I hope in the future, I know presently we do on specific projects, but, um, ourselves and in Marsat, we do work together um, to improve things. Um, so we do collaborate and coordinate on various things. And I think that's the way it should be. So commercially, we are competitors. But when it comes to safety, um, we do corroborate 
um, and work through um, uh, the IMO and uh, our regulator, the, the uh, IMSO, or the um, International Mobile Satellite Organization. So, um, yeah. And, and I think that's, yeah, that's I think a great that's point, uh, Carl, that, you know, when it, when it does come to safety, uh, everybody does pull together. And, you know, I, I've, I've worked with you at the IMO and with, with uh, Marsat. I know that to be the case. It's really a benefit to that arm. Speaking of that, I'm just going to launch another poll here, and this is about um, people's um, uh, use of the different uh, services on board ship. So the question is, are you likely to equip GMBSS equipment from both providers, uh, that's in my site and Iridium at the moment, um, or only one? Kyle, could you just talk about this for a moment? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, right now the existing technologies on, you know, most vessels, um, we believe we've done a good job in producing something new and improved and low cost. Um, and so it's interesting to see how things moving forward in our experience so far. And I've been lucky enough to find time to go and talk to shipping companies. And by the way, if there's any people from shipping companies listening, I'm always ready to um, come out and talk to them and get actual proper points of view, not derived points of view. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm just talking to the companies that, uh, you know, I've been invited to speak with and also friends that I, you know, I consider them friends, people that I've worked with for a number of years in shipping companies. And yeah, there there are those companies such as Jan de Nol, who are making specific policy decisions. So right, because we believe in safety, because we want to support our crews, because we believe safety is a, you know, basically an iterative process that we should always be trying to make it better. We are taking this step to put Iridium GMDSS on board our vessel. So it's it's just interesting for us to get to to know the opinions of the uh, of the industry. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Carl. And so there are the responses. Okay. So it's fairly, yeah. fairly even. Yeah, fa okay. fairly even. But you, you can see that there's still a little bit question about um, redundancy, um, which brings me to this question by Peter. Um, you know, we talked, do you need one or two um, uh, terminal systems? Um, Peter wants to know about redundancy. You, do you need a single um, uh, a system on board? You, you showed your um, Iridium console. Do you need just one or do you need two of those for redundancy? Under the GMDSS rules, you're required to have two approved terminals. Now, they can be from different providers. So that, that is part of the ambiguity of that last question is we said, you know, they can choose both but, or, or they can choose one, but we didn't say which one. Um, but yeah, so they, they, you do have to, if you're a solace class vessel, you do have to have, and you want to go into A3, um, generally, um, if you have, you have to have redundancy, you would generally have two SESs or satellite earth stations. I think you can actually have um, MFHF, but that then limits you to MFHF coverage. So most vessels just have two SESs, and now what they're doing is instead of having two Inmarsat ones, they're swapping out one Inmarsat one and putting an Iridium one. Um, just so they have diversity. Um, but also we have seen, and in particular vessels that travel up north where, you know, there, there are coverage issues uh, traditionally, um, they are putting on two Iridium um, terminals, which is good for us. It's, it is good. Um, and I, I say that because it's like, you know, um, we don't automatically derive benefit from ha them having two terminals. I think the people on board the ship derived benefit because we have built in some automatic redundancy features in the Iridium system, such as if you have two Iridium terminals and you get in a, a bad situation and you've got your terminals, but say the first terminal, um, there's rigging flying around and it smashes the antenna and takes that antenna out. Uh, it's no longer usable, but you still get your second terminal. Now the RCC on shore wants to call you. The Iridium system will automatically detect that SES1, the first terminal, has been taken out and it will automatically route the call to SES2. So effectively you have live redundancy. And that's something where, where, that we've built on. And because it's safety services, we don't get any money for that. <laughs> it's just, you know, something we built in because it was a really good thing to do. And again, you know, I think for those, um, for those people, hopefully they'll never have to use these kind of systems, but it, it is there if need be. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Carl, um, we we have another question. Well, we have lots of questions, but uh, this is Captain Afsel. Um, he said, and you touched on this in your presentation, but he wants to know: um, uh, Can iridium be used for routine or general communication? So we we know it's got the emergency uh, system. Uh, you mentioned slightly about calling mothers. Um, uh, I know that may be a special case, but can you talk a little bit about more about can the system be used for general uh, uh, calling of both commercial and individual crew members? Can individual crew members use it? And if so, how is that paid for? Yeah, so the, the Iridium uh, system does all of the GMDSS stuff. It does all the safety, uh, sorry, the security stuff, but it also does general calling. So it is technically capable of picking up the phone and dialing a normal landline number and saying hello to your mum. And it's what we call a priority four call. So in the GMDSS, you've got priority one, two, three, and then priority four is routine calling. And, and that's effectively what you're doing. So you can make normal calls, Priority four, call your mum, mum calls you, that's priority four. The SMS capability um, is priority four. The good thing about the SMS as well on this terminal, uh, the LT3100S, is they've got uh, a web GUI and you can actually type the messages and SMS through the web GUI. And you can even do SMS to email. So you can send an SMS to someone's email address and they can send you an email back um, to your SMS capability, which is um, pretty cool. And that's priority for normal comms. And there's also what we call a, a low speed um, modem capability, which allows you to do simple um, email. So you can get a, uh, like a third party application, which can start up this low speed modem connection and you know, send and receive emails. Um, and, th and that again is all priority for and can be used for normal ships communications. And uh, yeah, but can you just uh, make a call to um, your mum? Um, you technically can, but keep in mind in most uh, solar fast vessels, this terminal is going to be in the bridge um, and uh, it's going to be in the safety station. So just warning you, if you're going to call your mum, um, everyone's going to be able to hear you because you're in the bridge and there's people around and they're going to say, woo. So, yes, so <laughs> technically it's possible, but um, maybe use one of the other phones potentially. <laughs> So, 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 Carl, just on on that, um, in, in terms of cost, if if you did want to call your family, um, you know, possible emergency, um, uh, how would you, how would you, how would a average seafarer go around paying for that? Yeah, I mean, I think in general these uh, these terminals are going to be used by the company to call the ship because it is in the bridge. I think there's other systems, and we have other systems that can have phones down away from the bridge because the last thing you really want is someone, you know maybe having an argument, you know, back home about, you know, what the dog did or something like that whilst people are in the bridge trying to work. Um, and it just gets billed to the SIM. So whatever, whoever set up the SIM account. So if you're on a leisure boat, um, that gentleman I spoke to on the sailing boat, Will, um, he's got it set up. He can ring up and call shore and say hello and keep in contact with people while he's doing his solo sailing around the world. And that just gets billed to his SIM account, which is like your mobile phone account yeah, yeah. And, it, and it, mobile phone is a good example as well because there are different plans and will sort of you know because he's going to be away making lots of calls he's taken on um, one of these plans that allows him to make more calls at a lower rate so th that sort of basically works around similar to mobile phone plans okay great so uh, the, the, there's your answer look at the details look at the fine print um, you, you bring up this this excellent point, which is, you know, there are such a range of communication needs on board from the emergency to the commercial to personal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to launch this next uh, poll um, here, which is around that, which is what is the single biggest uh, vessel connectivity challenge facing your organization? So, again, uh, Kyle, maybe you could have a word around this. Yeah, so um, obviously, the, you know, us creating this new system is great. Um, you know, I, I really do believe it can make a big difference um, in the industry, just in, obviously in relation to safety, but also, you know, maybe shrinking down the amount of systems you have to have in a bridge. So instead of having three separate systems, you've got one system that does three or maybe more um, jobs. Um, and so it is uh, interesting for us to know what the drivers are out there in the industry and what really, um, uh, you know, what really uh, 
pushes people to make um, decisions or not make decisions. Um, and, and not only for this, but you know, future services and future capabilities, we might be able to build or build under this existing capability. So it's interesting information for us. And we also asked this question last year, so we're interested in the difference between the two potentially. Okay, let's just have a look at some of the responses here. There you go, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is in line with what we had last year. Um, you know, hardware and installation costs and new technology, it's a capital cost in general. So yeah, it's not, it's, uh, you know, the, whenever you're putting on new equipment, and it's not only the cost of the equipment, but it's the cost of getting people on board and, you know, on solar glass vessels and merchant vessels, it's, you know, they have to come on board in a port stop. Like when I was in the, the Mumbai Merce, we, they just had a stop, I think they stopped us for about six hours. So we had to basically get in, get on, do what we needed to do, test everything, and then, get off so they could leave. Um, so yeah, it is a, a big decision. So it's, it's not a surprising answer. Um, but the um, inconsistent, unreliable connectivity is, is interesting. I think that might be higher than last year. So yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so the next question comes from um, uh, Hank. Um, and he says, uh, this is about uh, MSI, and we had a lot of questions about this. I know you covered it in your presentations, but uh, last year there were a lot of questions about MSI and the coverage. So Hank says, can you explain the actual status of that MSI coverage by Iridium? Is it full coverage, or what were some of the issues around that, uh, Carl? Yeah, um, okay, from the Iridium side, it is absolute coverage. Um, and we had to have absolute coverage of our system to be able to get the letter of compliance and go operational. So from the Iridium side, um, we have absolute coverage. The issue is that some coastal states aren't sending us all of their information, or a lot of the times, it's they haven't made a declaration that they're completely operational. So they may be sending us the information and it goes out every day, and you know you can see the information in the terminal, I can see it in the system. It's just they haven't made that bureaucratic step of declaring operational service for various reasons. Um, and it does um, confound me um, because we have been up and running for about two years now, but it comes down to the basic fact, Iridium can't broadcast what we don't get. And if they haven't declared operational capability, then technically that area, that, C, uh, that um, NAV or MET area is not operational, although the information may be flowing freely. Um, in my view, it should be viewed from the mariner's perspective, similar to an, a Navtex issue. If there's, you know, information's not going out on a Navtex transmitter, maybe the transmitter's broken down. That is not a problem for the mariner. They can take, um, mitig uh, or, you know, they can take a mitigation response. So if, you know, they can get information from another source, but in general, it's not a problem for them. It is a problem for the shore side. And that is our view on this is, look, that we have a, you know, potentially a coastal state that it maybe is not sending us all the information that they should. That's their problem, and that's a problem for IMO to fix. That, so they and IMO need to work together and fix that problem. For the mariner, it's not a problem. They just know that the information is not flowing freely, and therefore they can um, get the information from alternate sources. Um, and so that's our view, and, and that's the situation. But the IMO EGC panel more recently is, I think, really pushing hard to clear up um, some of the issues on this side. But um, yeah, I, my view, it's a shore side problem. It's an IMO problem. It's not a mariner problem. Okay, uh, thanks, Carl. And um, I'm sure people will take that into account. Um, now you mentioned um, IMSO, uh, and there's a question here from um, uh, Carlos. Uh, what exactly is IMSO? What is the role, and, and who uh, who are in IMSO? Okay, so IMSO, um, are the International Mobile Satellite Organization, they are basically the regulator for GMDSS. So they are housed inside the IMO down in London. Um, they uh, basically do all sorts of things, but one of the key things is um, they, they over, uh, provide oversight for the GMDSS operators such as ourselves. And once every quarter, we do what we call a contingency exercise. So there's a specific scenario that they wanna make sure that we can cope with amongst other things. Um, in particular for Iridium, it's if our primary ground station in um, Tempe, Arizona 
is uh, taken out because, you know, large asteroid or something like that took out that facility, Iridium needs to be able to recover from that within an hour. And so every quarter we run an exercise. And I think if you've seen recently, we did one, um, I think it was in August or September. Um, no, we did one, sorry, November, time flies. Um, we did one at the start of November with IMSO and uh, I did put some information on it on LinkedIn. And basically we, we run through an exercise where we simulate that the one facility has been removed from the equation, so to speak. And we now then have to um, start up services or get services running back to a fully operational capability at an alternate facility. And that's what we practice and prove and pass every uh, quarter. And so IMSO actually fly over to Arizona we, you know, we sit in a room that we've got all these people around them and all these systems around them. They can see everything that's going on. We actually have a terminal in there as well, so a, a terminal in the side of the room, and we can run end-to-end -end tests showing them, right, this is, the, uh, you know, this facility is fine right now. Simulate that this horrible event has occurred, and now we can stand up services on these other, this other side. So back to the start, uh, IMSO is the regulator. They keep an eye on us and in Marsat. They do that through things like these regular exercises and other activities. Um, and generally, we just work with them quite a lot. You know, I'm, I've been emailing the guys at IMSO even today, organizing uh, things for next year and exercises that we're doing. So yeah, that's the, the whole architecture of the regulation and oversight of Iridium uh, and, and, and GMDSS in general. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Carl. Now, um, Carl, not, not surprisingly, there are a lot of questions coming in about training. But before I start opening up those trainings, you did mention in your presentation about some training. And I know that you've provided us with um, a sample of one of your online uh, training packages. And this is one of the most common things about how do you test? How do you test safely uh, the equipment uh, and not trigger a false alarm? So um, uh, this is a this uh, I'm just about to play a video if the technology works or if I can work the technology properly closer to it. Um, uh, this will take just over two minutes. So uh, enjoy this, folks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Iridium's new training series for our latest maritime communications and safety technology. My name is Kyle Hurst, and I'm the director for maritime safety and security at Iridium. I'm here at Swanwick Marina near Southampton, and we're going to do a short demonstration video for you today on how to test the distress features for an Iridium GMDSS terminal. So we have here our LT3100 from Lars Tran, and testing the terminal is quite easy. All you do is go into the menu here, you go right to the bottom of the GMDSS tab and it has terminal test here. We press enter and now we can press start. Now it's gonna ask us to press the red button here in a second. This is the only time you should press the red button when you're not in distress. Um, it doesn't actually send a broadcast to the rescue coordination center. So, you know, it's in a test mode and uh, th that means it's safe to press the red button. At no other time should you press the red button unless you are in distress. In some countries, it is an offense to create a false distress. So please be aware of that. So we are in test mode, we're ready to go. So we press start first. It now asks us to press the red button, which we're going to do. Green is good, means we're in test mode. And now we're initiating the test of all the different services. So we'll first start off with the distress alert. So it's sending out information um, and confirming that it works. So that's passed already. Then we start up the test of the distress call. It calls back to the core system and accesses a recording. The recording runs for about 10 seconds and the terminal can actually detect that the recording is running. You can't actually hear it, but it is coming through the handset right now. Once it's run for about 10 seconds, the terminal can then confirm. Um, that the call was successful. And so that should take another couple of seconds. Call's terminating now and it's passed. So now those first two tests have passed. We press the next button. Now we're gonna test the maritime safety information features of the terminal. So these are the broadcasts that you get through free to the terminal. Um, so here it goes right now. It's running uh, various tests to make sure that it can actually receive broadcasts. Also, the, the key feature of the Iridium system is it doesn't just rely on single broadcasts. It actually has a checking feature in the background to make sure that as much as possible, the terminal has all the latest information in it. So it does periodic checks to make sure the terminal is up to date. It's now past that as well. So we go to next. 
this final screen here, it lists off all the services, the distress alert, the distress call, and the MSI, they've all passed, and then we can finish out the test, done. Thank you very much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and also consider subscribing to stay up to date with the latest information on Iridium GMDSS. And please visit iridium.com for more information. And finally, thank you very much for watching. Right, um, uh, hopefully that was uh, enjoyed by everybody. Um, probably not as enjoyable as the um, uh, the video you did with your son over the weekend. Um, uh, <laughs> but for those of you who <laughs> for those of you who might have seen our social media advertisements for this webinar, uh, Kyle, uh, in order to show the enthusiasm of the public, um, engaged one of his. Uh, uh, sons to uh, show that level of enthusiasm and that will probably get lots of comments on social media so well and uh, in short, he was quite excited to be included in the video so uh, it was a really big deal his debut to being in the background you know i told him it was meant to be an extra but uh, he, he decided he wanted to try and be the star so oh well and, and he was indeed sir he was indeed uh, <laughs> so I, I i mentioned that there are lots of questions coming in about uh, training uh, one of them here is Leslie, and uh, he says that, uh, very interesting, uh, will you involve maritime colleges to teach cadets face-to-face -face how to use Iridium systems? And also, while you're on this, uh, Kyle, that there have also been a number of questions about um, simulators and the availability of uh, simulators for training colleges. So mm -hmm. if you could uh, just uh address the training issues a little bit yeah um thank you and uh believe you me uh i wish in some ways um there were more of me um and we are actually getting more people on board actually but not, not necessarily me me um i don't want to go into cloning that'd be terrible um but yeah um we need to do more on this i have done quite a lot and you know obviously there's videos and thank you for playing it I, I got annoyed watching it because i can see my hair is sticking up in the background and i'm thinking why is my hair sticking up it was probably because of having a nap between all the thousands of takes that i messed up but uh i messed my hair up but anyway um so we do the videos um we do have our website i have been talking and working with various training establishments who've reached out to me and I know um, we have a requirement to do more. So I am in the in the new year, we're going to set up a facility on the Iridium website with more content um, that, that training establishments can pull down and use. Um, so that's going to be an improvement. Um, in the meantime, I do know that uh, quite a few training establishments have bought their own equipment. And sometimes you can talk to some of our dealers and um, uh, you know maybe you can get some kind of deal from our dealers. We don't make the equipment, so I can't sort of say to you, yeah, here's some from my personal stock or anything like that. Um, so you, yes, it, it all comes through from the manufacturer. Um, I do know uh, a number of training establishments have uh, put them in. I see them on the system. Um, and I do know that we have two that I know of, simulators, one from Poseidon and the other one I can't recall off the top of my head, they do um, Ectus. But um, yes, there are two simulators out there. Kongsberg, I think it is. Kongsberg. Um, <clears throat> so there are two uh, simulators out there. Um, and also I have as much as possible, um, and I did one last week with the, one of the universities in, in Norway. Uh, I have been doing guest lecturing as well. So I've been trying as much as possible to support um, training. We do need to do more work. Um, but in the meantime, we do have the videos and please like and subscribe um, and also <laughs> check out <laughs> check out the Iridium uh, uh, website. Um, and uh, yeah, um, any inquiries, please send them through um, uh, to Iridium um, through because we have an interface page on the Iridium GMDSS website. So send through your inquiries. We do our best to help you out. But understand we are trying to build something more in the future to, to support training globally but it is as you can imagine a big job there's a lot of people out there and a lot of mariners um coming on board which is good um so uh yeah lot to do okay carl uh thanks and, and training is very important and uh, you know uh, for all of those of you who are challenged uh in your training establishments um uh, do do have a look at um uh some of uh, carl's um online training 
um, uh, modules. Uh, they're very good. Um, so, uh, uh, Carl, I'm going to ask you this question, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit because I'm not sure of the accuracy of this question, but perhaps you do. Uh, and I won't say who, who, who questioned it, but it says, uh, in some countries like India, have banned the use of Iridium phones. Uh, they may be banned in some countries uh, due to terror attacks. Uh, he references the Mumbai uh, attacks. Uh, and his question is, what would be the status in 2024? Well, 2024 is basically the status that we have right now. So for Iridium GMDSS, I understand the, the incident and the, that history. Um, I will say, though, that Iridium GMDSS is different. Um, and we do have, you know, legal opinion on this. Uh, we have, I've checked with the lawyers on this one, basically. Um, right now, Iridium GMDSS is a recognized system under um, Solus, and India is a signatory to Solus. Therefore, um, they do and have to allow um, Iridium GMDSS equipped vessels um, to be able to have their equipment on in territorial seas because it's safety equipment. So it, you know, it, it's different to what you know the issue was previously. This is GMDSS that has to be allowed. And that incident is many, uh, I think it's about 20 years old now. Um, but the uh, situation is right now, Iridium GMDSS um, uh, can be used because it's a um, recognized system under Solus. India is a signatory that, to that. And we also have, uh, you know, and I, and I know we have vessels that are equipped with uh, Iridium GMDSS going to Indian ports um, these days. So, um, yes, in short, no problem in that particular jurisdiction with Iridium GMDSS because it is part of Solus. Okay, thanks very much, Carl. Um, and just to make sure that everybody's awake and has their fingers poised above their buzzers, we're going to do another uh, pop up poll. So, this one is when considering the per purchase of GMDSS solution. What is more important in your decision making? So uh, again, Kyle, if you could just uh, have a um, uh, give some background on to this question. Yeah, so it's um, similar to the uh, the other questions. It's getting a feel for the industry and what drives or doesn't drive uh, the decisions. Um, you know, from my part, we've spent you know probably over 10 years developing this system and getting it recognised and going through the IMO process, which started in 2013 and then. You know, the recognition, um, so we put our application in 2013, we got recognition in 2018, and another two years to build the system, but we also had a lot of work before that as well. So it's been about 10 years, many man hours and lots of money to produce this system, but it cannot do any good if people don't actually install it. So knowing um, the drivers in, in the industry is key for us to make sure that we know what what what, um, what helps and what hinders, so to speak. So, yes, a very interesting question. And we did ask this last year as well. So interesting to see um, people's thoughts 12 months down the track or just over 12 months, I think. Okay, and here are your answers. Okay, well, that's good to see. I think that's a bit different. I think um, <clears throat> capabilities, including voice, is up from last year. Total cost of ownership was high before. Ease of installation, yeah, I think that's fairly similar. But yeah, the capabilities including voice is key, which is to me is excellent. It means you know people understand what we're what we're talking about, and uh, you know if you've got it, it can help. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I I know Carl, you uh, you've spent a lot of time. Uh, I mean, I've been working with you for many many years, and uh, you spent a lot of time looking at the human element aspect of this, and I think that's you know where where the voice comes in because when you're in trouble, it's Quite often easier to talk about what what what's happening, um, uh, and and so I think that is recognised. Can, can you talk a little bit more about some of the other aspects that you've had to deal with from the human element point of view? I, I know you you regularly talk to seafarers about how they use uh, the equipment and what's important to them. How is that from you talking to a seafarer, which I know you do? Uh, how does that go into the design pro process um, for upgrading systems that are more uh, fit for purpose? Yeah, it, it's obviously a key, <clears throat> a key factor in the design purpose, but I think for me, 
there are a couple of you know key tenants of the behavior in safety communications that maybe need to be re-examined and you know back when i was at sea and you know onshore dealing with them um, i used to investigate marine what we call marine as, uh, incidents but they're basically marine accidents or problems at sea um and one of the key things that I saw in, in a number of situations is sometimes the human element element wasn't even really part of the equation. Things just happened too quickly for people to act. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, I, it confounded me. It was, you know, sometimes depressing to know that, you know, they, they, they never had a chance. That's so unfair. I think I was struck by that shouldn't be like that. They, they, they shouldn't be that way. And so one thing that I thought of many years ago and I've been sort of mulling it around, we, you know, we do talk about things like this in the various IMO and, and other forums, lower forums, is that what can we do more to improve safety and, and, you know, maybe, you know, help the mariner. And I think that there's a, still that scenario in, you know, modern safety communications, whereas you press the red button when you're in distress. In other words, when you know <clears throat> you have no other options, then you press the red button because you have no other options. You're, you're, you know, you know that things are going badly. But for me, looking at some of these incidents and some of them are on smaller boats and some of the, you know, the people that were, you know, injured or, or worse in these incidents, there weren't the, the senior people or anything like that. There were people who were quite junior and just come on board starting their life at sea. And unfortunately, something happened that, you know, wasn't great. Um, so I, I, I really do think that there potentially as a technological issue we could have systems on board that alert people on shore that there might be an issue and one particular um, um, incident that uh, was was very big in Australia that I, had, I was got pulled into it was actually a coronial inquest about it um, <clears throat> and I had to actually give evidence of the coronial inquest and it was quite distressing because the, the family are there and they're very emotional and they want to know what happened and you know anyone would um, but the, the whole point of that was that they never had a chance to press a button. It, it just never happened. So some kind of technological response that can inform people on shore that these people might be in trouble or a change in behavior where people don't wait till the red button needs to be pressed. Maybe make what we have in the Iridium system the safety call. You know, when seas are getting rough and you can just call up the RCC and say, look, guys, I'm not actually in trouble, but it's really rough and I'm a bit concerned and I just want you to keep an eye on me type thing. And because in that particular incident um, that I spoke about, um, they never had a chance was one thing. But because no one actually was able to press a button, to light a flare, to trigger an EPIRB, they didn't even get a chance to get in to grab the EPIRB yeah, yeah. because they didn't have a chance. It was 36 hours until people um, you know, actually became aware that they would even had a problem. So it was a capsizing and basically the, um, the the sole person who survived was in the water for 36 hours until by a one in a probably a billion chance, a vessel saw this person in the water and said, hey, what are you doing out here? And rescued them. And that's when they basically found out that 36 hours ago, this vessel had capsized and, you know, there was a whole incident to it, um, a whole history to, you know, things that went wrong to create this horrible situation. And there are a number of failures um, but the, the key thing was that <clears throat> they didn't have a chance to, to press a button to light a flare or anything like that. So potentially in the future, we may have systems that preempt the problem. So if all of a sudden the RCC is or some other organization is keeping an eye on someone and they don't hear from them, they, they can then assume based on their previous knowledge, that's not right. They need help. I need to send someone out and help them because they, they you know, they did say they they were in, in a challenging situation. So I think that's the thing that interests me in the future is trying to improve systems. So it not doesn't necessarily have to rely on the human element. And we can give the people on shore a bit of a hand in understanding the situation so they can make more informed decisions because it is yeah. expensive launching these assets. Yeah, uh, and we, we, we appreciate that, Kyle. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for the work that you do with Mariners. And from the Nautical Institute's point of view, uh, we, we are absolutely um, uh, committed to um, any feedback that we get on user needs to share those with the GMDSS community uh, to try to improve those systems. Um, we are running a little bit of tight on time. I've got a quick question here from an absolutely practical point of view. Uh, uh, there's a guy named David, not me. Um, he says, how robust is the antenna and the receiver? 
Given the critical role of GMDSS, could vessels carry a backup unit? Um, yeah, it, I mean, it is robust, but it is electronic equipment. It's not, you know, what we say, bulletproof. And, you know, if it's a solace class vessel, they generally under regulations have to carry a backup capability, whether that's another Iridium terminal or the, you know, an LT3100S is their choice. But yes, you would have a backup system of some kind. My preference, but I'm biased, is an Iridium yeah. terminal, <laughs> of course. Um, but so you definitely should have it. But yeah, the, the, it is, you know, not, you know, we have a saying, it's not rocket science. Many things are not rocket science, but this pretty much is. And these terminals are, you know, very fine technology, but they do have a, a level of fallibility to them. And, you know, if you smash that antenna or, or whatever, then, you know, you're going to take down the system. So part of dealing with that is redundancy, of course. But I will say, you know, th this terminal has been, you know, hasn't literally been through the ringer, but it's been through a lot. And we do have it on some very challenging platforms. And we did, I think it was well over a year of testing on vessels that we knew were challenging. You know, we, um, and well, we, but also the, mainly the manufacturer put it on vessels that were uh, in very challenging situations. Um, so we have done a lot of testing, but nothing is perfect. Um, yeah. So that's why we have um, redundancy um, built in that, uh, yeah, if I was back at sea, this is the technology I would want, so. Okay, yeah. great. Um, uh, I do have my eye on the time, and we're gonna launch a, a quick final poll here, because we've talked a lot, and a lot of the questions coming in are about the difference between you know, safety critical systems and communication systems, and should they be joined, uh, should they not? Uh, so uh, this question, uh, does having all the one, uh, uh, an all-in-one safety GMDSS security and general communication provide a valuable option for ships. Uh, so Kyle, maybe just a quick introduction on this. Yeah, I mean, traditionally the, these systems were broken up and I think there are some people in the industry who think, you know, we should have a GMDSS terminal and an SSAS terminal and an LRIT terminal and a normal communications terminal. And there, there is a, you know, an argument there for keeping them separate. Um, but there's also the other argument, and I remember dealing with one of my friends from a shipping company who was quite irate about this, and he said, you know, they keep adding bits of equipment and requiring extra bits of equipment, but the bridges aren't getting any bigger, and we're still going to fit people in them. So he was quite irate about the idea that, yeah, just throw more equipment at them, and they can pay for it and work it. So the idea of sort of rationalizing down to a, you know, a very capable and very solid single terminal, I, I think is appealing from many aspects, but I also understand that that traditional aspect of, you know, you know, we have separate things for separate jobs and that's how we, we work. So um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, and here we have, okay. There you go, justified. And uh, I, I might say that from the Nautical Institute's point of view, uh, like I said, we, we're very uh, committed to user needs. And for many years, we've talked about this because the back of the bridge or even the, the old radio room uh, unit. Um, if in an emergency, you've got to use it, you want to be familiar with it. And mm. uh, you know, if it's an everyday piece of equipment, albeit with GMDSS uh, functionality and the big red button, you're more likely to use it well. And this goes back to my original comment about making good decisions, is yeah. that if you're familiar with it, you're probably going to use it more effectively. Yeah, so, and I, uh, by the way, I just want to say yeah. I'm very interested in that debate because I do know that when I was at sea, that you know, the the big red button, the, the the skipper was the one who dealt with that. No one else really worried about it. So, um, but uh, you know, I understand. I, well, I believe it's familiarity. You know how it works. So anyone can press the button and help. So yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and maybe we can work on that uh, and get some more feedback on that in, in, in the future. So on, on that note, I, I am going to bring the, the, the webinar to a close. Um, we've had lots of lots of questions. I, I am going to pass these questions on to Kyle after, afterwards. Um, and uh, you know, I know that um, uh, Iridium will be interested in, in seeing those questions and helping to answer some of them. Uh, so if you haven't had your your question answered here. Um, uh, they will be passed on. Uh, if you have further questions, let me know uh, at the Nautical Institute or, or, or contact Kyle directly. Uh, yeah, I'm just sure. one thing, Dan, if I can yeah. say just 
quickly. Um, if people want us to do more of this, um, we're happy to do more and maybe we do less presentation and more q and I'm happy to look at that as well. So please, specific feedback if you want us to do more of this chat type scenario. I, I, I th if people are happy that we, this is why we do it. So we're more than happy to support this format if people want to see it more. And uh, uh, yeah, so please give us your thoughts on that. Thank you. Sorry. No, 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 thanks, Carl. And uh, there, there will be, after the webinar, there will be a little pop-up uh, survey. And if you have any comments on, on, on that, if you'd like more, uh, put it in the comments, and that would be great. So uh, on that note, I will re uh, remind everybody that the Nautical Institute is a membership organization. And your uh, uh, membership is, is absolutely encouraged uh, for all of you. Uh, not only is it an international membership, but we have over 50 branches around the world, and they make really great networking sections to go and meet people locally. Uh, most of our branches now are back to holding physical meetings, which is great, uh, and you're more than welcome for that. So become a member, um, be safe, use GMDSS wisely. Uh, Kyle, thank you ever so much for your time and for your wisdom. Um, it's really appreciative that you're sharing that with us. And um, thank everybody for attending. Thank you. Okay, bye for now.